Hello and welcome back. In my last couple of lectures, I talked about historical figures who made Rome great, like Cicero and Virgil and Augustus. Today, I want to talk about the people of Rome, and in particular, the institution of citizenship in ancient Rome, and how that changed over time. Now, you might be wondering, how did the Romans treat their citizens, and what did it take to be a citizen? This is something that comes up a lot now in our culture, and it's worth talking about here. In the early to mid-Republic, so from 509 BCE um, up through, say, the end of the first century BCE, here it is. Roman-born men and women who are free are citizens. Now, women don't have voting rights, to be sure, but they have to be citizens in order to make citizens. Immigrants could become citizens relatively easy. In addition, freed slaves living at Rome or in Roman-held territory were also considered to be Roman citizens. Now, I put a star by both of these two things because features two and three, the fact that immigrants and freed slaves became citizens, was a fascinating thing in the ancient world. Uh, the polis states of ancient Greece had guarded their citizenship very jealously. And the options for freed slaves or immigrants uh, for citizenship were actually pretty limited. Um, there's a fourth group of people who could become citizens, and these are people who belonged to communities that were allied with Rome. Uh, so whole villages and whole cities would be given, given citizenship privileges. And there were a couple of different flavors with this. Um, you would get voting privileges, and in that case your citizenship was called optimo iure, or you could be given citizenship without voting privileges, and this was called citizenship sine suffragio. What does citizenship grant you? What does it give you? Men have the right to vote. Taxation happens at a rate that is favorable, uh, but you are liable to something called tributum, and this is where the government will assess you at a certain rate every year on top of your regular taxes if it has special needs. Uh, men were liable to have to serve in the army according to what that year's needs were. And during this period, there was no such thing as a professional soldier. Uh, commanders, officers, cavalrymen, and uh, men on the ground alike were all recruited for that year, which meant that their most senior commanders and the most basic infantrymen were just as likely to have the same amount of experience on the battlefield. Often the commanders had the least amount of experience. There's a quirk to this, though. You actually had to meet certain property requirements to serve in the military. So if you were rich enough to be able to have a horse, you're probably going to serve in the cavalry. However, if you were relatively poor but still had some property, you were going to be serving in the infantry. The, another privilege that granted you as a citizen is that you were traveling in Roman-held territories. You weren't subject to the provincial governor in the same way that non-citizens were. Provincial governors in this period of the empire were actually there to rule over non-citizens who lived in an area that was considered to be at the edge of the empire. Let's move on to the late Republic now. During this period, so the period uh, of the Civil Wars, uh, turn of the last century BCE. Roman-born men and women who are free are still citizens. Freed slaves are still citizens. People belonging to communities allied with Rome are still citizens. Um, and what does that mean? At this point, it's all of Italy south of the River Po, and that means uh, all of the boot part of Italy that you can think of when you look at it on the map. Um, and Caesar, later on in the late Republic, would actually go on to extend citizenship to the Gauls living north of the Po River. What did it mean? Men still had the vote. Taxation happens at a rate that is favorable to you. Uh, you're still liable to something called tributum, but it only happens in special cases. Military service changes, however. In 107, Gaius Marius began accepting citizens without property into the army, and B, paying them. Uh, before this point in time, I said that they were levying troops, and you could be drafted into the army. Uh, but this was not a paying position. You might be compensated in some way, but it wasn't considered to be a career because you were a citizen soldier, and you went back to your day job when the campaign was over. But at this point in the late Republic, the Roman army became a volunteer or professional force. And that meant that most of the people who were recruited into the military came from lower socioeconomic classes, because for them it was a way into a job, it was the way into opportunities, it was a way into a stable lifestyle. The last privilege accorded to citizens here is that you still weren't subject to a provincial governor in the same way 
uh, that non-citizens were. And this was a real advantage, especially if you were trying to do business at the edge of the empire. Moving into the time of Augustus, who gets to be a citizen? Uh, all Roman more men and women who are free, freed slaves, people belonging to communities allied with Rome. And at this point, this was all of Italy, a lot of Greece, and the western part of the empire. And the leader of any community that joined Rome as an ally was instantly a citizen. Members of auxiliary forces of the army, i.e. non-Romans, uh, the Romans liked to employ archers and slingers and cavalry who were Gauls or from other parts of the empire. One of the, the benefits of doing this service for, for the Romans was at the end of your term of service as an auxiliary, you and your family members became citizens. This is the last group, members of the Roman legions. Well, in the slide before this, wasn't I talking about how Roman legionaries were by nature citizens? Yes, but clearly at this point in time, non-Romans are joining the legions as a path to citizenship. This is happening during this time, too. And what did it mean during the Principate? Men still had the right to vote. Taxation happens at a rate that's favorable. The tributum thing is pretty rare at this point. Citizens were not subject to a provincial governor in any kind of way, so all of your rights are still there. Now, let's flash forward a couple of hundred years. Who gets to be a citizen in the early 3rd century CE? As of 212 CE, the following thing happens. Uh, the so-called Antonine Constitution happens, and this is brought about by a ruler named Caracalla. Um, and he has problems. He has money problems. In order to keep the empire safe, he needs to pay the army at a rate that is better than the inflation that's happening with the coinage. Well, in order to pay the army the amount that they need in order to not rebel against him, he has to find the money somewhere. How does he get this money? He makes virtually every free person inside the empire a citizen. In his Antonine Constitution of 212 CE, all men and women who are free become citizens because they're now taxpayers. What does Roman citizenship mean in this period? Men and women have the right to taxation. Um, at this point, there's no compulsory service in the military anymore. And at this point, if you're living in a province, you're living in a part of Rome. And so the way that the provincial governorship works, um, it's pretty well laid out and you don't need special protection from the governor. So it's fair to say at this point, the value of citizenship is greatly declined because there's no voting privilege anymore. There's no voting right. Of course, you have protection under the law the same as any, any other Roman citizen. But even at this point, uh, the Roman citizens have been divided into honestiores, those who are more honorable, and himuliores, those who are more humble. So it seems that while everyone is a citizen and equal under the eyes of the law, some are more equal than others. There are probably some lessons to be learned here too. It seems that if citizenship is given away so freely, fewer privileges come with it. While if citizenship comes at a price, uh, in certain cases, voting and having to serve in the military, uh, a lot more comes with that, a lot more respect comes with that. In a way, all of this truly changes the nature of the empire and it begins looking more like something else. Stay tuned for my next lecture.